This morning, uh, I'm launching into a new sermon series, and it will be four messages that will run consecutively over these four weeks. And it's based on an observation that I've made about human nature. Have you ever been bothered by somebody, or they annoy you, or maybe they're even hurting you in some emotional way or spiritual way, and um, you think you know what's wrong with them, and you want to change them, you want to fix them, but they don't listen. And so the issue is still there. Sometimes I found that the problem isn't with that person. Guess who it's with? <laughs> it's with me, it's, it's with you. And so it takes some introspection, it takes some inner looking to determine that something in me needs to change so that I can relate to that person differently. Maybe there's something about me that's triggering something in, in that person. And so this is sort of rooted in what Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 3, and, and a lot of Christians quote this verse, and it goes something like this. Jesus said, Why do you try to take the speck of sawdust out of your neighbor's eye when there's a whole plank of wood in your own eye? He said, take the plank out of your eye first, then you can see about taking that speck out of your neighbor's eye. So in that regard, I want to launch this series that's entitled Getting It Right. Working on yourself before working on others. Because so many times that's what needs to happen. And if we, have, if we take the time and have the courage to really examine within ourselves who we are and what we're doing, sometimes we can discover something that needs to change. And we, we can become uh, more real with ourselves and realize that there's something broken in me that needs healing. And so we can come to God asking for that healing. And God, I believe God can help us with that. So this morning, I want to I wanna focus on the life of Moses. Now, when you think of Moses, what do you think of? What do you picture? Ten Commandments. How about the Red Sea parting? I was telling the earlier service that um, from what I read, when they filmed that, the, you know, the movie The Ten Commandments with Moses, and the part where he, you know, he holds up a staff and parts the Red Sea, they actually used jello to get that effect. Uh, they didn't have all the special effects that we have now, you know, with computers and all. So they, yeah, they used wiggly jello that made it look like the water had parted. It was just like being held up. Just a little something, no extra charge. Uh, for, <laughs> sorry, throw that in there so you think I was smart. Um, yeah, so you think of these kind of things, because Moses was a great leader. You know, he led the Israelites out of Egypt when they were slaves. He parted the Red Sea, with God's help, of course. Um, remember anything about a burning bush? A little story there. I'm going to talk about that. So I want to look at, you know, the broad scope of Moses' life as I try to, to make the point that there's two things that we believe commonly that are not true, two myths and I'll, I'll name those and tell you why we shouldn't hold to those. But I want to start by looking at Moses' life, and I'm looking in the book of Exodus, which is one of the first books of the Bible, in Exodus chapter 2, and I want to read uh, two passages for you. Moses, um, as some of you might recall, if you watched the movie or read the story in the Bible, um, he was a Hebrew, he was one of the Israelites, and at the time that he was born, the leader of Egypt was killing all of the uh, Hebrew babies because there were so many of them, he was afraid they'd all rise up one day and overtake his kingdom. So all the babies were, the male uh, Hebrew babies were to be killed. So Moses' mother, when he was a baby, put him in a basket, floated him down the Nile, and the royal family in Egypt uh, picked him up and raised him in the royal family, but he was still always uh, part of you know, the Israelite family. So we pick up the story there in chapter 2, verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. Because you see, the Pharaoh in Egypt, the ruler of Egypt, made the Israelites his slaves and always had his thumb on them. So they're, you know, they're, they're making mud and straw and they're building bricks and building all the stuff that he wants, you know, pyramids and stuff. And so they're, they're slaves. So all day in the hot sun, they're, they're, they're in this kind of slave labor situation and the Egyptian taskmasters are 
you know, whipping them, saying, you know, work harder or no breaks for you and all this sort of thing. So Moses, who at this point is 40 years old, he, um, he comes out and he's, and he's watching this and he's seeing what is happening. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and looking this way and looking that and seeing no one, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Now, I love the description here because Moses is doing something really wrong. He's killing this guy, but notice how he does it. He does it like you and I do things that are wrong. We look this way, we look that way, and we think nobody's looking, so it's okay to do it, to cheat or steal or whatever it is we're going to do. Whoever we're talking about that we shouldn't be talking about, they're not here, we look around so we can talk about that. That's what we do when we do what we shouldn't do. We look around because we don't want anybody to know that we're doing something wrong. The problem with that theory is there's always somebody who does know what we're doing. So he kills the Egyptian, hides him in the sand. The next day, Moses went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. So he thought he did it in secret. He thought that nobody knew, but obviously they have caught on. And uh, it's interesting, <laughs> kind of ironic, isn't it, that this Hebrew slave would say to Moses, who made you ruler? Because one day he is going to be leading them. Who made you the leader? Well, God's going to do that, but it's, it's not for a long time. So Moses kills the Egyptian because he sees something he doesn't like in the behavior of the Egyptian. And it, so he does it his way, but now it's coming back to him that maybe there's something in him that wasn't quite right, that he lost his temper and took matters in his own hand and killed another human being. Well, now Moses has got a problem. Next verse. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. And then there's another story that follows. When he sits at the well, he meets some ladies. He ends up meeting his future wife. He gets married. And for the next 40 years, Moses lives out in the wilderness with his family, and he's, his job is taking care of his father-in-law's flocks. He's a fugitive. Yes, Moses, the great leader, you know, with God's help, part of the Red Sea. He was a murderer. He made a big mistake. And it was a price to pay. He had to flee his home, which was very comfortable because he was living with the royal family, Pharaoh's family. So he, he, he's on the run, and now he started a new life. So we pick up the story 40 years later, okay? What's Moses up to? Chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see the site, why the bush does not burn up. So you know, you get the picture here. He's, he's, it's just another day with the sheep, you know, out in the edge of the wilderness. He's watching them, bah, you know, just kind of hanging out. But this day now is taking a turn because all of a sudden he sees a bush. Now, the bush is on fire, which I guess wouldn't be that uncommon, but the, the problem is, is it's not burning like a bush should. I mean, typically, if a bush caught on fire, it would burn for a while, turn black and smoke, and that would be the end of it. But it keeps burning. And now it's got his attention. So Moses goes over, and in our language today, we'd say, oh, I've got to go check it out. You know, I'm going to see what, what's going on here. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush. And this is where you, you, know, you think of James Earl Jones' voice, calling Moses, Moses. And so, man, if you're Moses, what are you thinking at this point? There's a bush talking to you, and it's calling your name, and it's on fire, but it's not burning up. So Moses said, here I am. 
But, you know, if we really think about what's going on, he probably said it like, here I am. Like, what in the world is going on? I hear voices from a bush. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Holy, because God's full presence was focused right there at that moment. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So God immediately identifies himself. Back then, there would have been many different gods that people worshipped, different cultures around that area. And God says, I am the God, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it says that Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God because it was the belief of the Israelite people that you couldn't see God and still live. Can you picture that for a moment? Have you ever wondered what God looks like? But if God suddenly showed up right now in this worship service, what would we see? I don't know. But it was their belief that it would be so overwhelming to see God the, the brightness, the, the purity, the immenseness would just be overwhelming and your heart would just stop and you would fall over dead. That was the belief. So Moses is hiding his face now because he, he doesn't want to see God. And if we saw God too, maybe suddenly the things that we've done in life that we're not proud of would become very visible to us in that moment as we stand in the face of purity and wholeness and holiness. He's afraid to look. Well, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I've heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. The home of, and here we have all the names that we can't pronounce, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So Moses has an assignment. There's a whole purpose to the burning bush deal. God needed to get his attention because he was no doubt in the humdrum of life as you and I often are day to day, off to work, off to school, whatever it is we do in life. God wanted to speak to Moses in an unmistakable way. So he has this burning bush. Moses goes to look and now out of the voice, out of the bush, God's voice comes and he and God says that he has heard the cry of the people and he wants Moses to help be a part of the answer. Now, isn't this interesting? Because Moses tried to help 40 years ago when he saw an Egyptian oppressing a Hebrew. But Moses did it his way. Uh, it didn't work so good. So now that he's been a fugitive, even though it's been 40 years and there's a different Pharaoh now, I'm guessing there's still people that remember who Moses was and what he did. There may still be a few wanted posters on telephone poles back in Egypt where people remembered what he did. So God's saying, I want you to go back to that place. And I will be with you. And I'm going to deliver my people. I'm going to use you to be my voice. And as the story goes on, Moses says, I don't want to do that. And I'm not gifted enough. And that's a whole other story for another day. But here are the two things that I want to lift up in the story that I hope will be helpful to hear as we think about this theme of um, maybe needing to work on ourselves before we try to change other people. The first myth I want to, you know, kind of dispel or explode is this myth that says experience makes you wiser. And we often say that. Um, we think that if we've lived a while, we have more experience, we're wiser. But I know lots of people my age or older who keep making the same mistake over and over again. It's not experience that makes you wiser. It's paying attention to the experience. It's reflecting on it. It's learning from it. It's saying, what happened in this experience that I had that, uh, 
that can school me, you know, that can teach me, that I can learn, so I don't do it again. People that don't take that time to reflect and learn about their experiences repeat the same mistakes in life. If someone came to you, your friend, let's say, they're on their fourth marriage, and they come to you complaining that their marriage is crumbling, this fourth marriage, what would you say to them? You might say, well, let's think about this. Okay, now four failed marriages, what's been the common denominator? Well, it's been you. So maybe, and this is not poking fun at people that have been married many times, it's saying that sometimes we need to look within ourselves and say maybe there's a factor here within me. Maybe there's, there's pain from the past, there's a brokenness in me, and it's causing me to relate to other people a certain way that's repeating the brokenness. And that until that gets fixed, I'm just going to keep having poor relationships. Because whatever's broken in me just keeps coming out in new relationships. Moses tried it his way 40 years before, and it didn't work so well. So now God is going to work in him. And God takes his time, evidently. And this is the second myth that I want to lift up, that it's not always true. We, we tend to think that time is our enemy. I don't have enough time. We've got to hurry up. There's not much time. And we live in a part of the country where we're always kind of in a hurry. You know, the Northeast Corridor, as they call it. You know, we're always, you know, come on, hurry up. Everything's drive through, microwave, in a hurry. God's timing is a little bit different. Moses was 40 when he killed the Egyptian. He waited 40 years for Moses to get to a place personally where God could use him for his plan. And then, so, so that means that Moses was 80 when God called him. And he was 120 when he died. This, you know, it was like Mo Moses' lucky number was 40. <laughs> he kept coming up. Yeah. Um, sometimes our time is different than God's time. And we say that sometimes, you know, as believers. Oh, yeah, God's timing is always right, and God's never late with his time. It's one thing to know it intellectually. It's another thing to live it out in your life and to realize that what you're looking for or what you want right now, number one, may not be right for you. Number two, you might not be in a place that you can receive it. And number three, it just may not be God's plan for you to uh, engage that way. Forty years Moses was in that wilderness watching sheep. It took 40 years. And I'm sure over that time he thought about what he did, and he realized that that wasn't the greatest thing that he did, taking matters into his own hands. So now God's going to get involved, and God's going to send him back. And I want, you to, I want you to hear the pronoun I in the story as I go back at the passage that I just read for you, because God is using the pronoun I, speaking of himself. Picking up in verse 7, the Lord said, I have seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. I have come down to rescue them. You hear that? Moses is going to help. God will use Moses. But it's all about God as the deliverer. In God's way and on God's time. And it took a while for Moses to be shaped as a person before he was ready to be a part of that plan that God could use him. You know, the point in all this is God is our deliverer. Do you believe that? Say amen. amen. That God can deliver you from sin and the desire for sin and the path and life of sin. And we think of sin as being anything that breaks God's heart, anything that you do that makes God unhappy, that he would grieve for you. God can deliver us from that life. God can deliver us from pain, the pain of the past. And if there's something broken in us that's causing us to repeat the same mistake over and over again, then God can give us the courage to look within ourselves and say, you know what? I see the pattern, and there's something in me that needs to change. And I need to, I need to get some help, whether it's just to spend more time learning about the principles of the Bible and how they can be applied to your life, whether it's seeking out counseling 
or help uh, from a trusted friend, whatever it might be. God is our deliverer. And God was the one that delivered the Israelites. And he used Moses. But it was a whole different way to do it because God's way is always the better way than the way that we would choose. And so my prayer for you this morning is that you might have the courage to look within yourself if there's something that you're struggling with, if there's someone that you're struggling with, to say, Lord, is there something in me that needs to change? Is there a reason why this relationship or this situation or experience keeps coming up? Is there something on my end that needs to change? Because it does take courage to look within yourself and say, I think I need to make a change. Lord, we thank you for your word and for the way that you teach us through the lives of these biblical people. We thank you for the commandments that you've given us. and We know that you've given us this teaching because you love us and you want to show us a better way. Lord, you are our deliverer, so please come and deliver us from whatever painful patterns are in our lives that we might look to you to show us the way, that you might give us a different perspective and a different path. All this we ask by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.